Lowitz, Head of the Digital Scholarship Services Department at Duke University. Uh, she has quite a uh, portfolio of projects that she's working on. You can read about her in your materials there. Uh, Dr. Alan Tullos is the co-director of the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship, which is the host site for the uh, uh, not only the Slave Voyages website, but quite a number of other uh, tools, products, services, including Southern Space as a major online digital forum for study of the South, of the American South. Um, John Scherer is the uh, press director of the UNC Press and is one of the, is noted as one of the most innovative press directors actually in the country. Uh, that's his section copy. Um, he, um, he has quite a, uh, a range of uh, projects and activities that he's undertaking there, including a new Mellon funded initiative that he's going to talk to us about. So I'm going to turn it over to our speakers sequentially. One of the things I thought about was that um, a, a tremendous outcome of the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database project over the years has been the people um, who worked with them, who worked on these sorts of projects, the connections that they made. So I'm hoping that maybe I'll convince a few of us that there's a real value in doing this work uh, even you're doing just to build a broader social infrastructure. Okay, well, let me first start by saying um, who I am. Uh, I do work with Project Vox. Project Vox will be a project that I'll we'll spend a lot of time talking about today um, and trying to use it as a way to help us think about um, what it is that we are really using to support digital scholarship. Um, I would well imagine that many of those millions of dollars in the transatlantic slave trade database go to salaries or people hired to do certain work. Um, there are other ways around it. Uh, you could just get a big team of volunteers, um, which is kind of what we're doing at Project Fox. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, we are a very small scale digital publication that's aiming to, drum roll, change philosophy. You'll get excited. Let me just give me some time. Um, philosophy is a pretty uh, conservative discipline of the humanities. Um, only 25% of undergraduates um, who major in philosophy are women. We'll talk about why that is. Um, we are working to create what it amounts to an open educational resource so that people can use this in the classroom and actually incorporate the voices of women. And as I've said again, we are a pretty big team, mostly of students and volunteers. So, uh, there's 16 people on the team this year, three-fourths of them are students, undergraduate students and graduate students at Duke University, as well as library and information science students. Um, let's see, uh, they, there's another thing to know about them is that they are transient, as students tend to be. Um, they don't stay with the project usually longer than a semester or an academic year, so we're in a constant state of flux. Um, new people coming in, other people going away. Um, as I get ready to introduce this topic of social infrastructure, talking about the people and the processes and the engagement that help ensure scholarship has impact, I'm going to go on what may sound like a little tangent, so bear with me, I promise it's relevant, on a topic that up until about five years ago is pretty unfamiliar to me. So, let us ponder for a moment, philosophy. Does anyone know a philosopher? In the back. Oh! A man? Just checking. Okay, um, anyone else? Sylvia? You know a philosopher? I know a number of philosophers because my husband's philosophy editor. They are almost all men. Almost all men. Does anyone know? Um, oh, I'm not going to ask. You. <laughs> Do you know this guy? Who is that, Martin? Descartes. Descartes? Who is Descartes? Well known, semi well known French philosopher of the past. So, of the past. The, the father of modern philosophy. Did you not know that apparently <laughs> it has been bred by this man? Um, he is the I think therefore I am guy, and if you study philosophy, <laughs> He looks large as the progenitor of modern philosophy. But, as some recent historians have pointed out, this particular thought, I think, therefore I am, 
was not actually that original, and the progenitors of that idea were actually women. Hmm. Okay. So, I'm just going to show one of them here, but to quote um, from scholar Christy Mercer on this topic, a number of late medieval spiritual meditations, especially those written by women like Julian of Norwich, she was just one person I could grab, but I could have also um, used some other people whose names I can't pronounce, I'm going to try that. Catherine of Siena, Teresa of Avila, involved the need to focus on the meditator's subjectivity's means to rethink everything the meditator has previously learned about the world. In other words, the critical pivot in Descartes' writing to focus on the self as the seat of knowledge was not so remarkable among his contemporaries. So, back to the present. My point here is not to talk about philosophy because we have several people who could correct me on that, but my point here is to, to say that it is easy to fall into a simple reading of a situation and ignore the complex reality that forms it. For instance, it's convenient shorthand to pin the development of ideas and the propelling of new modes of thinking to a single person or an aspect or a mechanism. But that can be short-sighted and ultimately undermine our understanding of how scholarship can happen. And it is true today, as it was in the time of Elizabeth and Descartes, that scholarly ideas are formed and moved across a social network and by social actors. That social infrastructure, from the skills and knowledge of the people involved, to the means by which they share their experience and expertise with others, to the ultimate engagement of others in this work, are as important as the technical means by which their ideas are disseminated. What we typically think of when I say infrastructure, the technical infrastructure. When we think about how and why digital publishing occurs today, it's easy to fall into our own mental shorthand for how scholarly communication happens. I publish, therefore, my scholarship has impact. Or other suppositions that flow from this. I have a website, therefore, I publish. I have a publishing software program, therefore, I publish. My scholarship is published openly, therefore it has greater impact. Certainly these are true to some degree, but not completely, at least not in a way that helps us really get at what we're talking here today about, which is, how is digital scholarship's impact dependent on and advanced by the social infrastructure? So again, I call attention to this, I'm spending all this time on this, because I feel like we're not always paying attention to it. We're looking at other things. We're looking at the technology that underlies it. We're looking at the tools someone is using, the middleware, even the internet itself. So thanks to many of our philanthropic organizations, we have a lot of these tools. They're very useful. Um, they're giving us an abundance of ways to produce and disseminate scholarly works. They make the prospect of sharing research in the world seem tantalizingly easy, and yet, it isn't so easy. A laptop isn't a publisher. It's not merely really the issue of getting something to look less out of the box and more polished, um, though the desire for good design is a recurring request, and I think any of us who work as digital scholarship librarians or librarians generally are helping people to publish there's always that, yeah, I could use that WordPress site that the university provides, but it's not quite blank. I could use that database, but, and then there's another little tweak. There are other things that people need. And as these publishing tools become more sophisticated, hopefully giving us more themes that we like, giving us more tools and make it easier for us to work. Um, even as it allows libraries, scholarly societies, and individuals greater confidence to take on roles that once were only the purview of presses, the need for more robust social infrastructure to support this work becomes glaringly apparent. It doesn't happen without someone there consulting and giving advice. It doesn't happen without someone assisting. It doesn't happen with someone educating on, well, you could do it that way. However, five years from now, it's not really going to be as good or as, as useful, or maybe even a year, no one's going to be able to find it. So, if we want to be successful, the first thing we need to consider is the people. The staff of the press, um, acquisitions, marketing, sales, build lists, they build relationships, they build reputations that bolster scholarship's chances to reach its intended audience and have impact. Yet, scholarship 
publish freely on the web can, in theory, reach more people. We don't need a publisher. But unless you have a strategy for search engine optimization, the DIY publisher's work isn't likely to be discovered, assuming that that target audience is even searching for this particular work in the first place. So, one of the things we've considered is the importance of the roles of the individuals that we work with, um, the expertise that they bring. Again, our topic is philosophy, and really our audience, really narrow, our topic is undergraduate uh, philosophy instructors. Really narrow. So we need a special kind of fly to catch that group. Um, we really weren't expecting, honestly, that many people would be very interested in the site. Um, not that traffic is everything. Dave, you write about a lot of things, but of course, um, you know, it's, it's, it's nice. Uh, but thanks to the efforts of students who work with us and the deliberate creation of an outreach and assessment coordinator position, we've had over 54,000 unique visitors from 180 countries over the first five years of the project's work. So, yeah, that can't surely be all philosophers. Uh, we have also conducted surveys and interviews with instructors who use our site to better understand how the site is playing those changes. So having individuals like an assessment analyst, having someone who looks at alt metrics, having someone who coordinates the work of outreach and assessment and makes sure that there's a good flow between those two. Those are some of the roles, just a few, of the expertise that's necessary to help us ensure that the publication has impact. Um, but again, while we've been fortunate to have students work with us who have some prior experience and training, most are gaining these skills through their work on the project. So an outcome of the project is an education and training and development of people. Speaking from my perspective as a librarian and from libraries that increasingly field questions from scholars about how to increase the reach and impact of their digital scholarship, libraries need staff in these kinds of positions, not merely to support this kind of work for faculty to come to them, but also to train students and faculty on how to do this work themselves and understand the value. So, where did our great experts go? They graduated. <laughs> and of course, they got jobs, right? Wonderful jobs. And once we train them and they leave, do they take everything that they did with them? Hopefully not. Um, the next step and the things that are part of that important social infrastructure are the workflows. Are we documenting what it is that they did? Um, if they write it down, are they sharing it with the rest of us while they're still there so we can make sure we understand it? Um, would it surprise you if I said that very few academics I've worked with are predisposed to document their work process? <laughs> and yet, students, graduate as well as undergraduate, benefit from some explication of the processes they need to follow, whether that's for conducting preliminary research into a philosopher, graduate students we do believe need some instruction on how to do research, sometimes in an archive. So really trying to be more explicit about what it is that we're expecting people to do and what it is we expect them to replicate or to prepare an entry for publication. So of course, automated workflows can go a long way towards assisting this process. I have a huge love of version control. Um, however, uh, that's not necessarily the only solution to this challenge. It, it really isn't sufficient. Um, finally, beyond people and beyond processes, there's a third category of engagement. We need to have more than one fisherman. We really need to have a lot of people for whom this is the thing that they take seriously, this is the thing they're going to continue. Again, in this case of Project Box, we're really trying to get more instructors to bring these individuals into their courses, to throw that in front of their students to get them to engage. So at some level, we need that kind of community engagement and we need to actually know who our audience is to be in touch with them to actually help them understand what it is we're doing and how they can do it as well. Um, maybe it's raising awareness. Um, maybe it's playing a role in building scholarship in the future. Um, I'm thinking of conversations last night. How are we training ourselves to build communities like this? Did any of us learn? How do we go out and engage other people? We probably learned how to share information. There it goes. There's no string attached. The fly is loose, and there's nothing you're going to pull back from it. Instead, we have to find ways that we can actually both reach out to them, listen to them, and if they give us suggestions, the 
the ways that we need to run our projects, we actually take those into consideration. We have, this is now we're getting really rough territory, we have a get involved page. <laughs> when you have a high school student from India contacting you and asking you, how can I help your project? It's both um, stunning and exciting, and um, it's a little um, humbling and scary because then there become real questions about how, how can they really help me do this? What can I do? What am I helping them learn how to do? But you can't turn that away because someone is coming and they're asking. And in fact, we developed this because we were getting those unsolicited requests. Um, I will call out Meredith Graham, our current uh, outreach and assessment coordinator for creating what amounted to a Revealing Voices series where she would go out, she does not, she will tell you, I'm not gonna, Low her confidence, or just, I don't like Twitter. I don't do it for myself. She's a musicologist. But she does Twitter for us. And she says, yeah, I go out, I find those connections. I feel more empowered to go out and try this in this other territory. And she's reaching out to people who are in our network and says, I see that you work in this area. Would you be willing to talk about your experience? How did you incorporate this into your work? And so through her connections, we have had, I think, eight, we're getting nine and 10 are coming up pretty soon, uh, guest posts of people who are essentially our partners in spirit. They're in our community, they're in our audience, they're interested in our site, and they teach and they research, and some of them are students, and they're talking about how they have actually done this work. So having their voices then reincorporated into the site is an important part of us also making it clear that we are serious about that audience. So in conclusion, um, if people and processes and engagement are critical to digital scholarship's impact, then we need to priority, prioritize these as much as and perhaps more than, uh, given the cost <laughs> and the, the seeming futility of the, the infrastructure than the technical infrastructure. As Project Box has learned from our very bare bones publishing operation, it, it's possible to achieve quite a lot with just a WordPress site, and frankly, it's a lot easier to do with WordPress than Drupal. Just not to get droopy on you, but that was a that was a bad phase. Um, but the, the efforts by um, uh, Educopia Institute and others to develop a publishing curriculum is certainly one place that we can begin strengthening this infrastructure, thinking about how we think about publishing is always involving this social component. And I will leave with um, things that I think I would rather try to, instead of in a kind of preachy way, uh, to have a conversation about, which are the ethical and educational considerations for that social infrastructure. Um, Three-fourths of our current team are not people who are heart-funded. And that's the usual. And they're getting, um, and because I care, uh, they're getting professional development. I meet with them every week. We talk about what they're learning. We talk about the alignment between the work that they're doing and what they want to do with their lives. And some of the students aren't getting paid a darn thing, and they're actually going to library school and paying for the opportunity to have a field experience where they then have to pay $86 to get parking on our campus. So let me just say that it's not a simple issue of managing a project with a very large student and volunteer base. It's a lot cheaper, but I don't think we're being um, as uh, cognizant and maybe not as visible about the labor that underlies digital scholarship. And I think we need to think about ways that we can put those faces and that work more front and center and have a very real sense of their value that they bring to digital scholarship. Thank you.